By choice Look or by... The lead. This is helping Chuck with a lot of quick, straight up and down hits. He saves it going into bonus time. This is easily the most exciting point series in Monster Jam's entire history. Today, Monster Jam drivers are constantly competing for crucial points. Whether it be the Action Pack Championship Series at the start of the year in a bid to make it to the World Finals, or even regular events after the Tour Champions have been crowned, where drivers compete for the coveted and all-important overall event championships. But it never used to be like this. After an absence for more than 10 years, the Monster Jam 2015 Fox Sports 1 Championship Series aimed to be a return to points earning action. 16 of the best, upcoming, and new drivers would show off their talents over 9 intense and thrilling rounds of events with only one driver being crowned the points champion. If you somehow have not watched this thrilling point series, I'm about to give you a reason as to why you should watch it. This is the story of Master Jam's best point series to date, and this is the story of the 2015 Monster Jam Fox Sports 1 Championship Series. First, a little context. 2015 was a stark departure from the exciting and action-packed 2014 Monster Jam season. It marked a shift from the destructive, as big as it gets approach to the tracks and the action on the track, to almost a more formal and more technical feel track-wise, and I guess even show-wise as well. Gone were the humongous and giant dirt mounds, campers waiting to be smashed and buses waiting to be crushed to now the more angled steeper and again more technical jumps that encourage almost a different approach in driving style this was mainly apparent for the 2015 fox sports one championship series where the tracks just a year prior were nothing like what 2015 had to offer with the new television deal with fox sports one started the previous year one of the tours would be converted into the championship series each week 16 of the best drivers would compete in nine different cities starting the tour off in houston at nrg stadium then at the iconic georgia dome in atlanta followed by a stop at tampa's raymond james stadium then heading up to indianapolis at lucas oil stadium then at the then edwards jones dome in st louis before going all the way up to Angel Stadium at Anaheim, then heading down to Arlington's AT&T Stadium, followed by the penultimate round at Detroit's Ford Field, and finally ending the tour off in Syracuse at the Carrier Dome. Each stop of the championship series would be given its own episode and broadcasted to Fox Sports 1 with Anaheim actually being given two episodes as one was dedicated to qualifying and racing and the other being mostly freestyle with a little bit of the obstacle course competition. Scott Douglas would commentate alongside Frank Krimmel for most of the series, though Dennis Anderson commentated alongside Scott Douglas for the first stop in Houston. The way points worked set the foundation for what we have today, though it was much different than how points work now. Points were only handed out to the winners of each competition, and the format of the event itself was also quite different. All 16 competitors would qualify into the event, with the fastest qualifier getting a single point to their championship total. If you qualified amongst the top eight, you would compete in the racing competition, win the racing competition, and you'd earn yourself two points. If you qualified in the bottom eight, you would compete in the obstacle course competition. Imagine the time racing competition you'd see in arenas today, only with a bigger floor space and lots more ramps to hit. And at some events, you'd be facing off against another driver. Winning the obstacle course competition would net you a single point. Then, all 16 drivers would return to compete in freestyle, and the winner would receive two points. This means that a driver could earn up to five points if they were at the top of their game. 
And speaking of drivers, the 16 competitors and their trucks were among some of the top talent and upcoming drivers that Monster Jam had to offer. The lineup included the likes of already established and thrilling independent teams like Brandon Dero's Bad News, Jim Benzik's Thunder 4x4, and of course the heavy hitters of the independents like Team Scream and the Stone Crusher team. Hooked was driven by Steve Sims' son, who arguably got his big break on the series driving Hooked. Donald Epidendio's Titan would be another, though his stint in 2013 through to 2014 also helped him gain his popularity. And that is not even half of the lineup. The rest of the lineup featured Feld owned trucks that had a lot of heavy hitters and upcoming talent. Names like Medusa, Bari Musawa, Dustin Brown, Lindsey Wink, Damon Bradshaw, Chuck Warner, Neil Elliott, and Charlie Porkin all competed on this series. Musawa and Brown would switch over to a different team due to Marvel's exit from the sport at the end of 2014. This meant that Dustin Brown would pilot Monster Mutt and Bari Musawa would pilot Zombie, a truck he would drive for almost eight years. The top four drivers in points would be awarded an automatic entry into the World Finals, which was the first of its kind minus the Young Gun Shootout. Speaking of the World Finals, every driver had something to prove. Whether it was to return to Las Vegas to win another World Championship, or some wanted to win their first. So come Houston, it was safe to say that tensions were high. Round 1 of the 2015 Monster Jam Fox Sports 1 Championship Series was underway in Houston, Texas. An exciting Chicago-style layout would prove to be difficult for many drivers, with four drivers not even finishing their qualifying pass. To add to that, Chuck Warner in El Toro Loco set the fastest time in qualifying, giving him an early lead in the points. Among the four who didn't set a time was Dustin Brown, who would win the very first obstacle course competition of the season and earn himself a single point. Over in the racing competition, despite losing in round one against Neil Elliott, Charlie Porkin would be given a second chance and subsequently defeat the fastest qualifier in the final round of racing, earning his very first points of the season. Freestyle set the tone for what the rest of the tour had in store. There were some great runs from the likes of Jim Kohler, Charlie Porkin, and Lindsey Wink. However, it would be Dustin Brown in Monster Mart picking up his second win of the tour by winning Freestyle, which earned him two more points. This put him in the lead for the Championship Series exiting Week 1. What you may also not have known is that nine other trucks were at the event and performed Exhibition Freestyles. Those nine trucks were Aftershock, Crazy Train, Spike Unleashed, Megabyte, Outlaw, Barbarian, The Rod Ryan Show, which was run on BJ Johnson's Mohawk Warrior, and Metal Militia. Interestingly, only Toddler Duke's run behind the wheel of Metal Militia was shown on TV, with the others never being mentioned or televised, but can be seen in fan footage from the event. After a thrilling weekend in Houston, round two in Atlanta would make the action on the series all the more dramatic and exciting and set the stage for future events. The track had undergone serious changes to that of the previous week. Gone was last week's Chicago style track and in with the all new Jersey style course with many new jumps and opportunities for drivers to make. Qualifying saw Damon Bradshaw enter the championship picture as he went fastest and earned his first point on the series. The same was with Byron Musawa in Zombie, who would win the obstacle course competition and also earn his first point on the series. Racing would see another new championship contender enter the picture when Lindsay Wink defeated Damon Bradshaw and ultimately won the racing competition that night in Atlanta and earned his first two points of the season. Freestyle was completely off the hook as many drivers either had phenomenal runs or crazy wrecks. Steve Color Wrecking Crew decided he wanted to unalive his rear axle. Like <laughs> While Steven Sims Jr. in Hooked 
would have a crazy rollover that was a spectacular finish to his run. Donald Epidendio, despite breaking the rear tie rod early into the run, continued to keep going until he hit the pyramid jump and rolled over. Neil Elliott had a fantastic run that culminated in one of the most jaw-dropping saves of the entire year, which put him in the lead for freestyle. Porkin, Bradshaw, and last week's freestyle winner, Dustin Brown, all laid down great freestyle runs that were filled with many great highlights. But it would be Lindsey Wink who would double down in Atlanta as he took home the freestyle win with two great saves, one of which where he nearly went over three times. After his stunning performance over the entire event, Wink was the points leader heading into Tampa for round three. With Dustin Brown in second place with three points, Charlie Porkin in third place with two points, and Barry Musawa and Damon Bradshaw, along with Chuck Warner, were all tied for fourth place all with a single point. Round three in Tampa, Florida would prove to be a fruitful event for many drivers on the tour. The racing style remained unchanged. However, the track design itself was vastly different to that of Atlanta. Rather than offering different angles, the track was mostly step ups, doubles, and even triples with steeper inclines for maximum airtime. Of course, the big feature was the absolutely outrageous yet insanely iconic backflip ramp, which featured a double-decker bus inside the massive dirt ramp. Damon Bradshaw would yet again go fastest in qualifying earning himself another point in the championship standings. Dustin Brown would also earn himself another point as he won his second obstacle course competition of the year. The racing competition almost entirely mirrored that of the previous week. Bradshaw had lost to Wink in the second round, and Wink would go on to win the racing competition in Tampa increasing his championship series total to six points. When it came down to freestyle, every run was either solid throughout or extremely exciting, yet only lasting a few seconds. Someone who didn't fit that bill was Steven Sims Jr., who arguably put himself on the map with an incredible freestyle run and a great save, along with a spectacular crash. Medusa and Dustin Brown would be the only two to be daring enough to hit the backflip ramp, with Medusa somewhat landing it and Dustin Brown almost getting a consecutive backflip out of it, but unfortunately rolled over. Neither runs would take the lead away from Sims Jr. Despite the great saves from Jim Benzik and Neil Elliott, along with the great run from Damon Bradshaw and Lindsey Wink, and even the short but sweet run from Charlie Porkin, Steven Sims Jr. did the unthinkable and walked away from Tampa with his first huge win in Monster Jam, two points in the championship series, and tied for third in the series standings. Wink was still two points ahead of Brown and the drivers in third place, but Tampa had proved that anything was possible on the Fox Sports 1 Championship Series, which made it all the more enjoyable heading into the next week. Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, Indiana was the host for round four of the Fox Sports 1 Championship Series. The track returned to the Chicago-style track scene at Houston, with a few noticeable differences. Almost all of the ramps were steepened significantly. The weird double pod in Houston was replaced with a single pod, which looks very similar to what we have today. And for racing, drivers started on the rollers on the outside before turning in to hit the racing lanes. The fastest qualifier would be Neil Elliott in Max D, who surprisingly had not earned a single point up until now. Another driver who would enter the championship picture in Indianapolis would be Steve Sims in Stone Crusher winning the obstacle course competition. Indianapolis would see another reoccurring occurrence take place, which saw the driver who would qualify the fastest would be knocked out of the racing competition. With this in mind, Damon Bradshaw and Monster Energy would defeat Neil Elliott in round two and subsequently go on to win the racing competition altogether, earning his first competition win outside of qualifying. 
Freestyle would prove to be interesting for one main reason that I've yet to mention. Over the years, and still at some events to this day, mainly those that aren't for a point series, the order of who comes out to freestyle is usually stacked in a way where the big guns and fan favorites are later in the order compared to some of the other trucks who usually go out earlier. On the Fox Sports 1 Championship Series, it was dependent on where you placed in freestyle from the previous week, but reversed. So, if you won freestyle, you would go out last the following week. And if you finished near the bottom, you would go out near the start. In the case of Indianapolis, Charlie Porkin and Gravedigger would go out fourth, while Hooked would go out last as he was last week's freestyle winner. Medusa and especially War Wizard laid down great runs to start the night off, but it was Charlie Porkin who really elevated freestyle to the next level. With insanely massive leaps, a signature Charlie Porkin slap wheelie, and this unforgettable save, he would take the lead away with a score of a 42. And after many attempts from the likes of Damon Bradshaw, Chuck Warner and Dustin Brown, none could match the magic from Charlie Porkin. Leaving Indy, Lindsey Wink was still in the points lead with 6 points, but now there was much more competition. Three drivers were tied for 2nd place, and many more drivers were hungry for points, so the remaining 5 rounds of the series would continue to build in intensity. Round 5 in St. Louis, Missouri at what was then the Edward Jones Dome would yet again show another shakeup in track layouts. The track style was once again the jersey style layout, and yet again featured new jumps to provide an even bigger challenge. Drivers would now start in the gaps between the freestyle pods, which meant that the ramps that usually hosted the inflatable starting gates would resemble the pods seen at other tracks along with the return of the angle jumps like the step ups and also a designated backflip ramp, though this time a lot more tamer compared to the massive one seen at round 3 in Tampa. Damon Bradshaw in Monster Energy would be the fastest qualifier once again, however was defeated in round 2 by Neil Elliott in Max D. Elliott, who had not even earned himself a single point in the championship series up until Indianapolis, would finally earn his first competition win of the season by defeating Lindsey Wink in the Lucas Oil Crusader and increasing his championship total to three points. This was also the first time the obstacle course competition would see drivers compete side by side rather than one at a time. And Byron Musau would win his second obstacle course competition win of the season. Freestyle would see a lot of phenomenal runs from drivers, like Neil Elliott, who went out first as the previous week he had only made a single hit in freestyle when his truck broke. His run would be one of the best of the night. However, his, nor some of the other great runs, would be enough to sway the judges away from giving the win to Chuck Warner in El Toro Loco, which was his first point since the inaugural event in Houston. The event in St. Louis would create a shift in the points that saw Damon Bradshaw secure second place and two-way ties for third, fourth, and fifth place. Round 6 in Anaheim would prove to be one of the most important events in the series so far. Angel Stadium provided the biggest floor space out of them all, and had an insanely huge track with some more changes. Jersey style would be the racing style of choice, and a lot of the angle jumps were back along with an extra jammer ramp for wheelies, a pod near where the trucks had parked, and possibly one of the most pointless features to a jump I think I've ever seen. The center jump had a half a tire sized chunk dug out of it on the front side, which essentially hindered anyone from getting big air leaps from that side. It can be seen in some tracks from the other non-televised events from 2015, and whoever came up with this, or thought it was a good idea, needs to be introduced to a straight jacket, locked inside a padded cell, and forced to watch NPC TikTok streams on repeat. Oh, what is that? Gang gang. Gang gang. Hum, hum. Yes, yes, yes. Mmm, ice cream so good. What the hell is even that? This goofy 
Graham would end up tripping Dustin Brown in his freestyle run. However, thankfully, he saved the truck, which was a great moment. However, that doesn't mean that this feature wasn't any less stupid. Anyway, qualifying would see Charlie Porkin and Gravedigger go fastest in qualifying. And Bari Musawa again picking up his third obstacle course competition win of the season. Racing would prove incredibly exciting as the final round would pit Neil Elliott and Charlie Porkin against each other, both having the potential of earning crucial and much needed points on the series. It would be Neil Elliott winning racing for the second weekend in a row. Before Freestyle, former professional skateboarder and then host of MTV's Ridiculousness, Rob Deerdeck, would perform a halftime encore stunt that saw him drive the Battle Corn monster truck through a motorhome. This was shown on TV and was the only time a motorhome was present during the 2015 season. Onto freestyle and every driver went all out. Almost every freestyle had a memorable moment or just a solid run in general. The crazy backflip from Medusa, the outrageous huge air leaps from Jim Collar and Lindsay Wink, a great save from Darren Gowen in War Wizard, and Damon Bradshaw's great run. These were just some of the best highlights from the event. However, the person who really had the moment of the night was Neil Elliott in Max D. In what I can only describe as one of the best runs, not just of the season, but arguably of all time, everything came together for Neil Elliott. His momentum was top notch. Every hit had some sort of abnormal angle that made those hits go from just a regular jump to a crazy maneuver, not to mention the huge air off the backside of the step up, and of course, these two jaw-dropping saves. The crowd, understandably so, collectively losing their minds is all you need to comprehend how amazing this freestyle truly was. However, it also marked a turning point in the points chase. Neil Elliott was now leading the series after weeks of not being amongst the top three, with Wink now in second place. Bradshaw and Porkin were in third place, Dustin Brown in fourth place, a tie for fifth place, Steven Sims and Hooked in sixth place, and his father Steve Sims in seventh with a single point. This series was starting to wind down, and the championship chase was beginning to heat up. It is important to mention as well that a non-point series event was held in Oklahoma City at the then Chesapeake Energy Arena. As referred to by it being a non-point series event just moments before, points were not awarded at this event. Because of this, I won't be mentioning the results. However, I felt like it was still worth bringing up. After Oklahoma City, it was a return to point series action as round seven brought us back to the great state of Texas, this time at Arlington's AT&T Stadium. The track was once again another Jersey style course with more of the jumps we had seen from St. Louis. The championship series leader, Neil Elliott, would not be able to defend his points lead, as instead, El Toro Loco driver Lupe Sosa would fill in for Elliott in one of only a few times Sosa has driven Max D. The fastest qualifier would be Damon Bradshaw in Monster Energy, getting him all the more closer to Team Max D and the point standings. Bari Musel would, for the fourth time this season, win the obstacle course competition, which put him in a tie for fourth place. For the first time this season, Damon Bradshaw would become the only driver to be the fastest qualifier and win racing, defeating Lindsay Wink in the Lucas Oil Crusader, and earning two more crucial points that come freestyle put him in the lead of the championship series. After racing, another halftime encore performance would take place, where Rod Schmidt in Monster Mart Rottweiler and Lupe Souza getting behind the wheel of the Boy Scouts of America monster truck would perform a tandem freestyle, which interestingly was not shown or even mentioned on television. Afterwards, it was time for freestyle, 
and we would see a slew of amazing runs. Charlie Parkin, Steven Sims Jr. and Damon Bradshaw would all have incredible runs that set the score to be incredibly high. Lupe Souza gets a special mention as he would have one of the longest and craziest save attempts of all time. As Souza really gave Max D6 everything it had to try and put it back on all four tires. However, it would be Dustin Brown in Monster Mart taking advantage of this situation. Lindsey Wink's Lucasaur Crusader truck was left out on the floor after he had crashed late into his run, and no one had yet to attempt to jump it. That was until Dustin Brown would set AT&T Stadium on fire, jumping over the truck along with a great technical run that also included an almost successful consecutive backflip. This would put him back in the point series standings, as he was now tied for third place with Lindsey Wink heading into round eight. I'm gonna ask Avenger a question. Okay, Jim, here's my question. Are you ever gonna score any points? Ha <laughs> That's an awesome question! Even with zero points, zero is still a number. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? While Jim Collar might have been rocking zero points, heading into his hometown show, round eight was the penultimate round for the championship series. Detroit's Ford Field was the stomping grounds for the 16 drivers to do battle. The track was essentially that of Arlington, which definitely wasn't a bad thing considering these tracks provided drivers with great opportunities. Detroit would prove incredibly fruitful for the point series leader, Damon Bradshaw. Yet another fastest qualifier accolade gave him an extra point towards his series total. However, a controversial race in round two with the returning Neil Elliott would put an end to his night in the racing competition. After just the first jump, Elliott's truck had drifted into Bradshaw's lane, bumping his truck and causing him to spin out and ultimately lose the race. Tensions were high and Bradshaw made Elliott know that he was not happy about the outcome of that race. Meanwhile, in the obstacle course competition, Bari Musau would pick up his fifth obstacle course competition win of the season. Back in the racing competition, it would be yet another Gravedigger versus Max D showdown in the finals. Interestingly, the same thing with Damon Bradshaw almost happened again with Charlie Porkin as Elliot looks to have almost intentionally drift into Porkin's lane. However, Elliot did not actually hit Porkin this time, unlike what happened with Damon Bradshaw, and it really didn't seem to affect Porkin other than him having to make a tighter turn. As a result of this, Elliot would make a crucial mistake, essentially missing the apex of the turn and driving up onto the freestyle ramp giving Porkin the edge. In yet another turn of events, Porkin would spin out in the final turn, giving Max D the edge and the racing win. Those two points would put Elliott in a tie for the point series lead with Damon Bradshaw. Freestyle had some killer runs from the likes of Byron Musawa, Neil Elliott, and Charlie Porkin. And the bar was set high for last week's freestyle winner, Dustin Brown. After an incredible run with two jaw-dropping saves, he would win freestyle back-to-back, -back, earning himself two extra points, heading into the final round in Syracuse. He was now in second place and one point away from becoming the point series champion. Heading into Syracuse, any one of the top six could have a chance of leaving the Carrier Dome as the points champion, which made the culmination of the series a must watch for all Monster Jam fans. Syracuse, New York. The final round in the 2015 Monster Jam Fox Sports 1 Championship Series. Game faces were on and drivers were prepared for an all out war in the Carrier Dome. The track had returned to the Chicago style layout yet again, However, this time with one main layout change. Some of the jumps were taken from the last two tracks in Arlington and Detroit, along with a small pod. But the big talking point was the addition of one of the most innovative backflip ramps 
in the sport's history. The ramp had a total of three sides to flip off of, with a fourth side being dedicated to launching the truck across the floor. Qualifying would see Charlie Porkin go fastest, putting himself in a favorable position in points with the possibility of springboarding into higher positions on the leaderboard. An unlikely face was not only present in the obstacle course competition, but also would go on to win the competition altogether. Neil Elliott in Max D would win his first obstacle course competition of the season after a disappointing qualifying pass. Still, this single point put him in the lead for the championship series. However, his biggest rival in terms of points had an advantage in getting to compete in racing until tragedy would strike. Watch what happens to Monster Energy on the final jump, Frank. Wow, there's one pass that shows how important every point is. It's Damon Bradshaw, Monster Energy right here, playing it all on the line. Bradshaw, in an attempt to keep his championship chances alive, would not be lined up for the racing lane and completely destroyed the front end of his truck. This would have huge implications on points. Not fixing his truck in time for freestyle would ultimately mean he would be out of contention for winning the series. The final round of racing would prove incredibly viable for the two drivers. In the green lane was the early point series leader, Lindsey Wink, while the blue lane would see Barry Misawa take his first shot at a competition win outside of the obstacle course competition in 2015. In a big come from behind victory, Bari Musawa pushed his way through to win his first racing win of the season. This would put him in fourth place, which was a favorable position in the series standings. It became clear that Freestyle was the points decider, especially when it was announced that Damon Bradshaw would not be able to fix his truck in time for Freestyle, effectively taking him out of the championship series running. Trucks like Titan and Thunder 4x4 set the stage high to start out with. However, with more of the big guns hitting the floor, they would raise the bar even higher. Lindsey Wink being one of them, successfully fending off Bari Musawa and Neil Elliott from the freestyle win. With two trucks left, the drama started to settle in. Whoever won freestyle here in Syracuse had a chance of changing the course of the series championship. Neil Elliott, despite no longer being able to earn any more points, was now hoping for Charlie Porkin to earn those two points and keep his points lead over Monster Energy. Controversy would arise when Porkin would take the lead away from Wink despite leaving 35 seconds left on the clock, meaning that Dustin Brown was the only driver who could deny Neil Elliott a chance at championship glory. Considering he had won three out of the eight freestyle competitions on the series so far, it was all down to this one freestyle run. After a fairly solid freestyle from Dustin Brown, it was not enough to take the win away from Charlie Porkin. This meant that Neil Elliott, who had only entered the championship picture until Indianapolis, was now the points champion. And well deserved too, with Elliott on top with 10 points, Damon Bradshaw with 9 points, Dustin Brown and Charlie Porkin both tied for 8 points, those four were the official guaranteed spots into the 16th Monster Jam World Finals. Bari Musawa finished in 4th with 7 points, Lindsay Wink finished in 5th with 6 points, Chuck Warner had finished in 6th with 3 points, Steven Sims Jr. finished in 7th with 2 points, and Steve Sims Sr. finished in 8th with a single point, with the other drivers not having any points to their name. For drivers who didn't get an automatic bid, most of the other drivers from the championship series would get invited to compete in the main field anyway. With Porkin and Elliott getting to run a second Grave Digger and Max D respectively, Monster Jam would introduce Introduce two iconic schemes for the two trucks. Hawkins Gravedigger would be given the now iconic green and purple scheme that featured chrome green paint 
with purple flames that looked absolutely incredible. While Elliot's Max D debuted the now iconic Candy Apple Red Max D design. For the drivers on the series, most of them fared fairly well at the event. Dustin Brown made it all the way to the semi-finals before rolling over against Todd the Duke, while Porkin would finish third and Elliot would finish 12th in freestyle both with iconic moments in their runs. That's not to say though that the others from the series didn't have their own moments in the event as well. In 2016, the FS1 Championship Series would return with many familiar faces from the first series, though a few new faces, most of which were all new independent teams. But the two biggest changes were that Adam Anderson would make his full season debut driving Gravedigger and Tom Mance was now driving Max D. The series would become known for completely different reasons compared to why 2015 was so well known. Anderson's sheer domination of the season to some made it boring and not living up to the hype of the previous year, especially when he was crowned the points champion by Detroit because no one else could mathematically catch up in the series standings due to the way the points were handed out. That's why a year later, the two new FS1 point series, along with every other point series for that matter, as that was when all the tours had a point series in the first quarter, was changed to where points were given out based on where you placed in a given competition, and not just if you won or not. This made it a lot more fair and awarded consistency rather than solely emphasizing a competition win. Though it didn't take away some of the tension that was present from the first series. This points method is almost exactly how all tours are run to this day. The 2015 Monster Jam Fox Sports 1 Championship Series, while being a mouthful to repeat over and over again, is one of Monster Jam's most exciting seasons that have ever been broadcasted to television. A simple premise executed to perfection, with varying track styles each week and a wide array of talent that either had already or made their big mark on the Master Jam world on this series, it was easily the most exciting points championship Monster Jam has ever had to offer. Every point mattered and it showed in people's driving. You either pushed it to the limit to gain the extra point or you crashed hard or had to make it up in another competition. The track styles are honestly some of my all-time favorites. They were a perfect blend of what Monster Jam was all about and what Monster Jam was shaping into. It's a shame too that a majority of these drivers from this series have either retired from the sport altogether or aren't at the forefront of the sport like they were during this season because this was one of Monster Jam's greatest times to be a fan. If you haven't been convinced yet to watch this season, I highly suggest you do. Watch the full episodes on the membership, or even the fan footage on YouTube. However you want to watch it is up to you, because you will soon realize how great this era of Monster Jam truly was, and why this is Monster Jam's greatest point series of all time. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all soon with some more Monster Truck content.